Thank you for coming to CSIS on this Friday afternoon. I am Dr. Mark Moyer. I run the project on military and diplomatic history here. Um, we host events that are targeted at the uh, current and future government leaders as well as the public writ large. Uh, we were created last year in order to uh, revive what we think has been somewhat flagging, uh, certainly in this town, the use of military and diplomatic history to inform foreign policy. And as historians tend to be reluctant to delve into current uh, issues, uh, but I, I think, our, and our general belief is that historians actually are, as well, are better equipped than anyone to, to look at current foreign policy issues. We've seen within the social sciences, much of the uh, use of history has fallen by the wayside in favor of economics or statistics. Uh, we also, See, politicians, and particularly on our topic today, we have politicians who misuse history, so historians have an important role to play in that respect uh, as well. Uh, historians don't produce easy pat solutions, but they do provide context and familiarization, which are critical when we deal with complex problems. And they help us also address analogies, which can be helpful, but also very dangerous. We generally invite a variety of speakers and you can look on our website uh, the next event we have in december is greg brzezinski talking about china and the cold war uh, usually we don't bring uh, back people in consecutive years but we decided to make a, an exception this year uh, we had last year we had uh, our speakers talk about his recent book the gates of europe on ukraine uh, but that, when i saw his new book the lost kingdom the quest for empire and the making of the russian nation I decided we, we needed to get him here. Uh, we haven't done much on Russia, Russia yet, uh, uh, and this is, uh, I think, uh, the most significant book on Russian history that we've seen this year. Uh, and it's not just timely in terms of current events, but uh, our speaker, Serhi, is also one of the relatively small group of historians who is conversant enough with current affairs, uncomfortable enough that he can analyze them uh, uh, particularly well in the context of history. Uh, Gary Kasparov, in endorsing the book, said, In Lost Kingdom, Serhi Plucky does for Russia what only great historians can do. Make the connections between the distant past and vital present feel relevant and alive. Uh, and I don't think I need to explain to this audience why Russia is so important today. We, we have uh, United States present, presence growing in Eastern Europe, uh, American allies in that area fearful of Russia. We have Russia active in Syria, where uh, the United States has struggled to define its own policies. Uh, and of course, you can uh, see just about any day in the news some report on Russian meddling in America's presidential uh, election. I'll give a brief introduction for Sergei. He's the Mikhailo Hrushevsky Professor of Ukrainian History at Harvard, uh, and also the director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard. He was born in Nizhny Novo Novgorod, which I probably butchered that. I, I can uh, pronounce the name of his interesting university, which was the Russian University of the Friendship of Peoples. Uh, he taught for eight years in Ukraine after that, uh, then moved to Canada, where he taught uh, until Harvard snatched him away from Canada in 2007. Um, Lost Kingdom is his 11th book. I won't read them all to you because uh, th that would take some time, but, but needless to say, he's, he's written many uh, groundbreaking books, uh, considered uh, pro probably the foremost voice in Ukrainian history today as, as well as in Russian uh, history. And this book certainly solidifies that uh, reputation. Uh, in order to facilitate the interaction between the policy worlds and the academic worlds, we've also asked someone from our policy community to uh, take part in the question and answer portion of this. So we'll hear from Dr. Donald Jensen, who is a fellow at SICE and at the Center for European Policy Analysis, or SEPA. He's seated here in the front. And is, uh, I'm not sure everyone knows, but SEPA has really become a breeding ground for the uh, foreign policy and European uh, policy in uh, the current administration. Their um, CEO, a former CEO, is now the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. Uh, and, uh, Wes Mitchell and Dr. Jakob Griegel of the State Department Policy Planning Council also came from there. 
So uh, certainly a critical place in today's policy community. Uh, Dr. Jensen is also a veteran of the Foreign Service and Radio Free Europe. Uh, but uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Serhi Plucky. Uh, thank you, Mark, for this introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming. It's, it's always a pleasure to come to Washington and to speak about history to people who make history. So it's, it's always interesting, it's always a challenge. Uh, I'm happy to introduce my new book. The book was released in October uh, here in the United States, and some of you I see have, have the book, so this is the cover to the left, and, and the cover to the right, this is the one uh, that was released in United Kingdom. The book uh, released in US is of course in US dollars, and UK is in pounds, so I encourage you to go for US dollars version <laughs> of the book if you, if you um, found it interesting. Well, the book is uh, something that I worked on for quite a while, and this is on the history of Russia, Russian national identity, and its relations to, the, uh, to its immediate neighbors, Slavic neighbors, and in particular Ukraine and Belarus. And uh, um, the current recent developments in the region forced me to turn that research instead of an academic article or the book that would be written just for my colleagues and maybe a couple of students into a book written for a broader audience that uh, engages the questions that are important today and the most important today question certainly for Eastern Europe and Central Europe is the Russian uh, aggression in Ukraine, annexation of the Crimea and as Mark was saying that uh, the, the resurgent Russia is of course of major concern uh, here in Washington and uh, around the world. Um, my book starts with, and uh, it's, it's not very, very well visible, but it starts with the description of the monument that you can see here on the left. This is monument to Prince Vladimir as he is known in Russia, Prince Vladimir as it is known in Ukraine. It was erected last year in November, one year ago, uh, opened by Vladimir Putin himself. And what is interesting about that monument is that this is second monument on the territory of the, of the former Soviet Union to Prince Vladimir. The first one was built in the mid-19th century in the city of Kiev, which is today the capital of Ukraine. It made a lot of sense to build that monument there because that was also the place that was the city where Saint Vladimir or Saint Vladimir ruled. He was one of the founders of the state that became known as Kievan Rus. Uh, the more problematic is to explain why the monument to the prince who ruled in Kiev built in the very center of Moscow. And that's, that's the question that I pose in book and try to answer it. And here I did a little Photoshop. So it's almost like a monument to the um, uh, William the Conqueror would be built in Washington, or the monument to uh, St. Donald would be built as well. So because, of course, St. Vladimir and Vladimir Putin share, share the first name. So what is going on there? And uh, that, is, that is what I'm trying to discuss in the book, looking deep into the starting with medieval times, Kievan Rus, and ending with the uh, current, current developments in the region. Uh, Kievan Rus is something that gave title to my book, so I consider it to be a, per, uh, perceived as a lost kingdom. And one of the arguments that I'm making there is that for centuries now, one of the driving force when it comes to the Russian foreign policy is to recreate that imagined unity of the medieval state that was centered in Kiev back in the uh, 10th, 11th, and then 12th, and uh, the beginning of the um, 13th centuries. This is, this is that state. 
It uh, fell under, under the, um, in, as a result of the invasion of the Mongols. And uh, uh, ever since Russia emerged on the international arena, and that was in the late 15th century as an independent state, independent from the Mongols, one of the visions was gathering of, the, of this lands, lands of Kiev and Rus. Uh, as you can see on this map, Moscow is in the center of this greenish, greenish uh, um, uh, part, which then is growing, then becomes red, then becomes yellow. But what is important that at some point, and that happened in the 17th century, it takes over the city of Kiev. And it is there in the city of Kiev that the first textbook of Russian history is written by the monks of the local monastery. It is there that the mythology of not just the origins of the Russian dynasty from Kiev, but also the existence of the big Russian nation that includes Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians is, is born. And that concept is extremely important for understanding today's conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I did some preliminary calculation. It seems to me Putin said that six or seven times, last time it was at Valdai, that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people. So this is, this is the concept that existed in the uh, 18th century, 19th century, but it didn't survive the Russian Revolution of 1917. Uh, here you see the map of the Soviet Union with a number of the first republics that were created. The Union was created as a result of this debate and discussion between Lenin and Stalin. And one of the outcomes of that discussion was that a special republic was created not just for the Belarusians, for example, and Ukrainians, but a special republic, the Russian Federation, was created for Russia, which was a major a major change in the Russian thinking about the unity of Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians. And again, the revolution of 1917, which anniversary, 100th anniversary, we marked, uh, and mostly people outside of Russia marked it less, less so in Russia, uh, marked in, in, in uh, um, um, the last, last few weeks. So that revolution played an important role of reconceptualization, what Russia is and what Russia is not. So the entire Soviet period, the concept was that Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are different people. So what does it mean when Putin today says that they are the same? Well, the meaning is very simple. He goes back to imperial pre-1917 Russian conceptualization of what Russia is and what nation is which is basically from the perspective of today's international relation is a very, very dangerous thing to do because what that means is that the borders that exist today are up for, for re reconsidering, can, can be moved. So Crimea is there. We see the hybrid war in Donbass. We have mostly ethnically Russian populated parts of Estonia, for example, around Narva. And uh, uh, so what we see is basically this post-1991 revisionism in which the idea is not to recreate the Soviet state, but the idea is really going back to Imperial Russia with, again, at this point, very, very unclear and unpredictable, unpredictable consequences. Um, in 1991, the Soviet Union fell along the borders of the, of the um, uh, republics as they were created in the Soviet Union in the 1920s and then uh, re rearranged and new republics were created in the 1930s as well. But what we see today is actually an attempt to, to revise those borders and revise those boundaries and again Crimea, Crimea is one of, those, one of those cases. Well, the revision of the boundaries is taking place in the context, of course, of in a broader global context. We hear a lot about, about European Union, about NATO. The Ukrainian uh, crisis was partially produced by the desire of Ukrainians to join Western institutions. 
And that story has not only geopolitical context in a sense that there is NATO and, and there, is, there is Russia, uh, but also a cultural and, and historical context. And what is at stake for Russia in Ukraine is not just a country, a second largest country after Russia in the post-Soviet space moving westward, but it's also the country that many in Russia consider to be the birthplace of the Russian dynasty, of the Russian nation, of the Russian literacy, and so on and so forth. So if you go back to the 19th and 18th century thinking and, and understanding of those things. And if on the Russian side we see these attempts to kind of rebuild the, the imperial model of Russian nation, on the Ukrainian side there is a clear orientation toward the West, where um, uh, this is the, 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 these are the images from Maidan, where people are prepared to go on the streets in sub-zero temperature it's November, December, January, February of 2013 and 2014, and stand there and demonstrate day after day, night after night, uh, uh, trying to make their point about basically them not being Russia. One of the first Ukrainian presidents, Leonid Kuchma, wrote a book which was titled Ukraine is not Russia, which is basically, it's difficult to imagine probably President Macron writing a book, France is not Germany. It's maybe easier to imagine uh, uh, someone else writing a book, Catalonia is not Spain, or something like that. But again, uh, that's, that's, that's the, uh, really the, the real bat battleground that is happening there in, in today's Ukraine. It's not just the, the lines between Russia and, and the West, it's also the redefinition of what Russian nation is and what what Ukrainian nation is. If you look at this map of Ukraine, and I hope that, again, it's better, you can better see it on the, on the uh, uh, screens over there than on the screen behind me. This is the ethnic population of Ukraine uh, as of 2001. That was the last census that was taken in that country. And uh, uh, the percentage points, like in Crimea, 58.3%, this is the percentage point of ethnic Russians. So basically, Crimea is one part of Ukrainian territory where Ukraine, the only part where the Ukrainians didn't constitute or don't constitute today the majority, the Russians constitute the majority. And in that sense, what you, what you see is really Russia claiming part of the Ukraine's territory that is largely settled by the Russians. You look at the, at the eastern borders of um, Ukraine where the percentage of Russians are under 40 percent, that's the area of Donbass, that's where the war is going on right now, where Ukrainians constitute, ethnic Ukrainians constitute majority, but ethnic Russians constitute significant minority. Now, when Putin says Ukrainians and Russians are the same people, what that means is that when you go to a place like Donetsk, Donbass, southern Ukraine, or eastern Ukraine, you, see, you hear people speaking actually the same language, which happens to be Russian, or with, with, with some elements, uh, some elements of, of Ukrainian, and then that language is called Surzhik. Uh, you move further, you move further to the center and then to the west, the percentage of Ukraine speakers grows. And when Russia started its, its war in eastern Ukraine, the model was that Russia was going there to reunite with, with, with the Russian population. And the idea was that nation and national identity and allegiance to a particular state is defined on the basis of language. So if you speak Russian, that means that you are Russian. If you are Russian, that means that you are, should be loyal to Russia. And this is basically 19th century model of what nation is. And that was the model that was proposed in Crimea. That was the model that was proposed in Eastern Ukraine. When you look at Ukrainian response to the, to the, to the war and Again, for the first time since 1991, the Ukraine is actually creates an army, a real army of its own. There is a fighting going on. There are people 
being killed and so on and so forth. What you see for the first time is that uh, Ukrainians mobilize in defense of their country across the national and ethnic and linguistic lines. If you look at today's war in eastern Donbass, good part of it is waged in Russian on the both sides of the, of the border. So from the Ukrainian side, you see a rejection of this 19th century model of a nationhood in which language equals your ethnicity, ethnicity equals your, your loyalty to a state. So what we see is an emergence, an emergence in Ukraine of a um, civic nation. And the map that I'm showing you here uh, the, the dots on the map are the monuments to Lenin that were toppled in 2013 in the, uh, during the Revolution of Dignity in Ukraine. And uh, what that map shows is that Ukraine actually not just mobilizes in, in, in a very different way, but it also rejects its old former communist past. So Lenin became a symbol in Ukraine of dependency on Russia. Lenin became a symbol of the corrupt regime that the Ukrainians were trying to get rid of. And what happened in Ukraine, most of, of these dots are in central part of Ukraine. There is very little in the West where the monuments to Lenin were removed immediately after the independence. With monuments to, the, to Lenin removed in the center, this is a sign of a basically much bigger thing than just shift in terms of historical memory and rejection of one historical narrative and acceptance of another. That means that for the first time in Ukraine, we see the emergence of actually majority that is oriented toward Europe. With parts of Ukraine lost in the east and in the south, that group became the majority. Ukraine through 25 years of its independence was the country divided almost like the United States 50-50. One government would go in one direction, another government would go in another direction. The big difference between US and, and Ukraine in that particular case is that in Ukraine it was also about regionalism. It was East voting one way and supporting one political force and West supporting another force. And what we see today is basically a consolidation of this new type of nation, which is not based on the language, but based on the common understanding of history. And, and for the first time, uh, is, is prepared to, to say that quite loudly and take arms if necessary to say that Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is not Russia. So uh, what, is, what is the future? And that's, that's where probably I will, I will conclude with that. The war that was started in Ukraine by Vladimir Putin under the slogan Russians and Ukrainians are the same people is actually producing a completely different results. You see Ukraine losing some territories but it actually mobilizing around the idea of this poly-ethnic Ukrainian nation to a degree that it wasn't mobilized before. And this, not the same kind, but a parallel process is happening in Russia. And that process is basically about mobilization of the ethnic Russian nationalism. Because look, Crimea, where the Russians are the majority, is attached to the Russian Federation. Other areas are just destabilized, they're not attached. So. Uh, this is, this is basically, uh, I, I'm showing you the, the, um, some artwork related on the left to uh, the Russian takeover annexation of the Crimea. So there is a connection, a unification of the Russian people. On the right side, this is a, a poster uh, produced in Germany after the Anschluss of Austria. So the, the model is more or less the same. The, Nation was divided by borders. The nation is now coming together. So, and we see, we see uh, really today the, the ethnic Russian nationalism on the rise in Russia. So the war produced results where nationalism is growing in Ukraine and nationalism is growing in Russia as well. They said two different two different models of nationalism. But again, that's that's certainly something that goes against against the original, original idea and perception that Russian language really means, means being Russian. 
Uh, I would like to, to end on, uh, I would love to end on a positive note and say that, okay, we, we, we saw the worst of what, what is there. Unfortunately, uh, what the research that I did for the book and the analysis that I provide there uh, doesn't allow me to be extremely optimistic. Um, what we see today happening in Russia is basically quite unique thing in terms of the Russian history. For the first time, Russians live in the state where they are the absolute majority. When they lived in the empire, when they lived in the Soviet Union, they were maybe sometimes minority, sometimes they were 50% of Russians. So now for the first time, Russians have a Russian state. And it's a very important question what, now they are free actually to, to behave in any way they want to behave, not to be afraid that by this behavior they can scare the non-Russian population. Again, there are non-Russians in the Russian Federation, but not to a degree that there was in the Soviet Union. And it's a big question of what, what Russians will do with this new opportunity and with this kind of a new found sense of identity. And the last four years actually don't point in the in a very optimistic direction from that point of view. Uh, again, I, I want to be hopeful, but this this is the this are the processes that are just starting now, and we'll see we'll see where they will lead to. They can lead to the further change of the borders. Again, we don't know what will happen eventually with eastern Ukraine, with Donbass, and whether it will go back to Ukraine, whether it will be declared a semi-independent or quasi-independent statehood, whether it will become part of Russia. We also don't know whether, where, whether the places like Chechnya will stay in Russia and for how long. So the borders can move both in, in, uh, in terms of the ex uh, expansion of the territory of the Russian Federation and also in terms of its shrinking, which is again not, not a very, very positive scenario for the development. Uh, I want to be hopeful, but again, I, I also wa want to warn with this book that maybe we have not seen the worst in terms of, of the rearrangement of the post-Soviet space. Because one thing is quite clear, uh, one of the books that, that I, I written is on the fall of the Soviet Union. I wrote the book as, as the last chapter in, in the history of, of a particular country. What this book uh, helps me to realize that the saga of the fall of the Soviet Union is far from over. And what uh, people here in Washington, including James Baker and others were afraid back in 1991 in terms of the potential war between Russia and Ukraine and other, other republics. Unfortunately, it, it comes, it, it comes to, to life today. Uh, again, my hope is that this book correctly presents, presents not just the current developments, but also finds the right place in historical explanation of what is happening and that it will help us to deal with whatever comes next in that part of the world. Thank you very much for your attention. So Don will uh, give you time to comment on that uh, terrific speech. Uh, I can only praise it. I, uh, first of all, I want to highly recommend the book, which I've, as I told you at lunch, read twice. Uh, and it's not only interesting, it's clearly written, well written. And the maps alone at the beginning are worth, uh, worth a look. Uh, there there are, are very few issues I've found in Washington in recent years and where, where history is as directly relevant to policy as in the Ukraine war. And I wanted to ask Sergei a couple of questions about the war and building upon his remarks to let us help, help us understand what is going on mm -hmm. a little better. And first of all, I wanted to ask about Putin himself. The Malorossiya concept was, I think, articulated by Putin on March 17, 2014 at the Duma. And he seems to have backed off that concept. And my question for you, Sergei, is uh, are the subsequent changes of position really tactical do you still believe Ukraine 
is, is not a separate country? And, and how do you explain the kind of shifting his position from that high point of Malavasia three years mm -hmm. ago? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, he, his reference was, and uh, maybe if you would allow me sure. to, to show that, uh, that will be. This is, uh, uh, this is the map of Ukraine, and in green, these are the territories that were a new state, uh, the, the, the plans in Moscow were to create a new state that would be called Novorossiya, New Russia. And above is the, the map of the Russian Empire where the original province of uh, New Russia was uh, situated. So as you see again, history matters here and this references and the names they're borrowed, they're borrowed from history. So the idea was that uh, immediately after the annexation of the Crimea, Crimea, my understanding, is important for Russia for a number of reasons, uh, historical, uh, et ethnical, ethnographic that I referred to, but also geostrategic. Um, the, re the rest of Ukraine is important as the second largest post-Soviet country, and the question was how you take Crimea, really antagonize the entire nation, and how you still keep that nation within your own sphere of influence doesn't allow it to go to the West. And the model was after the, the annexation of the Crimea that Ukrainian government in Kyiv was presented with basically ultimatum. That you provide a kind of federalization of the republic where each federal part of it would have a veto right over the decision on the foreign policy and po foreign policy orientation, which would allow Russia to manipulate, for example, at that time Donbass was still part of, of uh, Ukraine, and preclude any movement toward Western and European institutions. When Ukraine refused to do that, then the model was introduced that will partition Ukraine and will create new Russia. And that was, that was the project that's where the hybrid war in Donbass started. And Russians succeeded more or less in Donbass, so this uh, dark green part. But the rest of projected new Russia province refused to actually play along the, along the Putin's game. So that's where the mobilization of the Ukrainian, mostly Russian speakers, happened in opposition to the, to the Russian war. That's where the idea of this 19th century model of a nation, you speak Russian, that means you're Russian, was defeated. And what Putin ended up with was the part that he never actually wanted, and that Donbass, economically, economically a devastated area. But Donbass, it's what is left of Novorossiya and, and New Russia. And Till today, in, in this uh, self-proclaimed republics, you hear that, okay, we can't live on our own. We were conceived as part of new Russia. We should, we should continue fighting. We should take uh, Dnipro. We should take Odessa. We should take these other cities because we are not viable on our own. But Donbass and hybrid war in Donbass, that's what is left of non-realized project of Novorossiya, which is basically a a burial ground of the idea of the big Russian nation as it was imagined before the war. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, could you say something about the role of religion in both halves of the country? Um, <clears throat> language is one uh, thing that divides Ukraine. So in eastern part of Ukraine, the majority of people would speak Russian. In western central part, the majority would speak Ukrainian. The languages are uh, basically quite close. So uh, Ukraine is, in that sense, is uh, uh, a country of, of real uh, bi bilingualism. And, and so unlike Canada, where, where I lived, so that, 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 there it's very different. So anyone under, everyone understands or, or speaks Ukrainian. Everyone understands and, and speaks Russian. That's, that, 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 that is the norm. Another thing that traditionally and historically divided Ukraine was religion. The majority of Ukrainians are 
Eastern Christians. But within this East Christian group, they divided the majority would be Orthodox, the minority would be Greek Catholics, which means the church that has the Orthodox or Eastern liturgy, but jurisdictionally and in terms of dogmas and, and so on and so forth is part of the Catholic Church and uh, is, is uh, <clears throat> uh, in that sense oriented to, toward the, the West. Uh, Stalin immediately after taking Western Ukraine where the church is dominant, well, the first thing what he did, he converted forcefully, arrested the bishops of the Greek Catholic Church and uh, forcefully converted the uh, Greek Catholics into Orthodoxy, which was a weird thing to do for a communist regime and communist ruler who supposedly shouldn't care about, about to what church, if, if any, uh, uh, the, the uh, subjects go. So the idea would be to make them atheists, not, not to, to convert from, from Catholicism to Orthodoxy, but that's what happened. And that, that divide actually has been used uh, in, the, in the current war and in the propaganda. So first of all, the Ukrainian side was pre uh, presented as fascists, but also as, as Catholics. And representatives of, the, of this uh, decadent European values which come together with gay marriage and so on and so forth. And again, that's something that didn't work. So Ukrainians managed to mobilize not only across linguistic uh, uh, borders, but also across religious borders. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, people uh, in the, in the um, we are talking about Putin, 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 Russia, 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 but actually that propaganda, it had a lot of traction in Eastern part of Ukraine, in, the, in Crimea, in Donbass, for example. And it also brought a lot of Russian nationalists from Russia to fight there. So those people who are believe in things like the Russian world, Russian Orthodoxy, which is under threat from the decadent West, that there are fascists in Kiev, that there are uh, a Catholic church that is there to, to take over and distort the traditional Orthodox values. People believe in that. People go and, and fight for that and die for that. So again, uh, that's, that's a very complex and, 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 and often tragic, tragic situation, things that we kind of dismiss and think, okay, this is, this, this is unreal, people can't believe in that, people believe in those things. So uh, uh, again, the, the, the propaganda worked among some, not only among uh, some Russians, but also among, among many Ukrainians in, in, the, in those parts of, the, of Ukraine which are now contested. Hey, Sarah, if, if I can follow up on that, one of the themes that runs through the book is the influence of religion on politics. Could you talk about what the potential for that is today? One might think of the Polish example where the church did play a significant role in, uh, in politics a few decades ago. Do you see the church playing an influential role in the near term in politics? Mm -hmm. Well. Um Thanks. Before I answer the, the, that question, the, there is uh, one more remark that I wanted to make with regard to religion. Apart from uh, Orthodoxy and Greek Catholicism, Ukraine happened to be and used to be also the Bible Belt of the Soviet Union in terms of the Protestant religions. And the interim president of Ukraine during this crisis happened to be a Baptist. So that was also used in the Russian propaganda. He was a, a, a bloody pastor or something like that. So there was on internet, on Facebook, uh, attack on that. That was also basically one of the symbols that what is happening in Ukraine that's, that goes against the, the, the true orthodox values and beliefs. With regard to, to religion and, and the role that it, it, it plays today in Ukraine at, and it can play in the future. Um, uh, unlike Poland and for that matter Russia, Ukraine doesn't have either legally or de facto uh, state church or the church that would claim uh, its, 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 pla its place as a national church. Again, the Ukrainian churches themselves are divided between East and West. Significant percentage of the, of, the, of the communities are Protestant communities. Uh, the the um, 
Mormons have probably biggest following in Ukraine out of all post, post, post Soviet republics. So the place is very open religiously in, in those terms. And then it puts aside from, from let's say, Russia with really dominant and symbolically extremely important and dominant role of the Russian Orthodox Church, or traditionally historically important role of Catholic Church in Poland. So uh, Ukraine really doesn't fit in that sense, the, the, the model that both of its neighbors, Eastern and Western, follow. And I, I uh, really can't foresee a scenario where any of the churches really would be able to claim this, this uh, dominant role. So uh, Ukraine, pluralistic, very, very pluralistic society in many ways. Again, we talked about language, we are talking now about religion culture and so on and so forth and again it's it's not uh, from that point of view it's not surprising that the way how that state and nation survived was by mobilization across these lines as opposed to dividing and, and, and it, taking them as, as, as the boundaries for, for the creation of a new new enclaves or countries or could you say a word about the uh, a place with a deep historical legacy of, of Judaism. I uh, remember right when the war started, there was a full page ad in the New York Times taken out by Jewish rabbis denying the Kremlin's accusation right. that the Kiev right. government was anti-Semitic. Right. Well, um, <clears throat> Ukraine um, is, uh, is a place of uh, some really very horrible things that were happening to the Jewish community. So. Uh, the the uh, Khmelnytsky uprising and massacres of 1648 is certainly very deeply ingrained in, in uh, Jewish historical memory. Uh, the pogroms of the revolutionary times, the Baban Yar, the Holocaust, again, uh, to, to a degree that if you don't think about and speak about Auschwitz and extermination camps and think about where most of the Jews died, they died in, in, in uh, Eastern Europe, in, in places like Ukraine, and from that sense, Babin Yar is probably a better, more representative symbol of Holocaust than, than Auschwitz. It, so again, unfortunately, the place, the, the place is in Ukraine. So the, 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 the story of relationship between these two communities is, 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 really, is, is really very difficult. But something happened in the, in the gulag, in the prison camp, where the Ukrainian dissidents and the Jewish dissidents met each other in the 60s and 70s, and produced a model of, of cooperation that eventually produced independent Ukraine in 91. And the, the um, statement of the, of the, of the uh, Jewish communities, different organizations, it, like in any other country, Jewish organization, Jewish community are divided. There, there are different organizations. Uh, they're competing with each other. But where there was absolutely unanimity, that was in their common support for, for Ukrainian statehood and, and Ukrainian independence and sovereignty. And again, that that uh, certainly a very positive thing given the difficult story of Ukrainian-Jewish relations in the past. So we have time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, we have a microphone, if you'll wait till uh, the microphone comes, if you could state your name, uh, the gentleman in the front here, uh, state your name and affiliation and uh, pose a pithy question. Uh, my name is Hank Gaffney, uh, 28 years in the Office of Secretary of Defense and 23 years at the Center for Naval Analyses, but having also uh, 11 years of association with the Russians from 91 to 2004. Um, here's an administrative question. Thinking of the, we are now um, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Soviet Union. And uh, what was set up was an administrative state. And I remember, you may remember, um, I didn't catch it till mid 90s, Yuri Baturin took n verbatim notes at the meeting at Novo Ogarevo in March 1991. Um, and uh, it was very clear what, what the Soviets had done was put national people in all the republics. And they wanted to keep their republics. And, um, and the, the one that held out the most was Nazarbayev. 
who really wanted his own Kazakhstan. And um, to me, that was very symptomatic because Yeltsin himself was creating a Russia which was finally Russia. And, and I note that um, in Donbass, um, the administrative system was such that they still got their pension payments out of Kiev. Now, how does that fit into your whole ap approach to this? Well, uh, what you described is, is uh, the moment of the creation of the Soviet structure, which was absolutely essential for the fall of the Soviet Union and understanding what is happening today. Because what happened was that the uh, Soviet, so the Bolsheviks took over what was the Russian Empire and precluded it from falling apart. They actually gathered it together. Ottomans f fell. Austria-Hungarian Empire was gone. Later British Empire was gone. French, Portuguese, the Soviet Union kept going and basically, so that was still the old imperial territory and old imperial peoples. The Bolsheviks believed and the Communist Party later that they actually found the way how to, uh, how to get around history and whatever the tendencies are there. They created this autonomous republics where they connected territory and nationality and were given cultural rights and linguistic rights but not political rights to the to people living on those uh, territories. Again, the, the population was shifting, so Kazakhs eventually ended up to be minority on their own territory. Ukrainians kept being the majority, but half of them lost their language. So processes were going on, but, but the, the borders remained, the, the nationality in your uh, ethnicity in your passport remained, and so on and so forth. And all of that played a very important role in 1991 when when the, the, the countries, the Soviet Union encountered economic problems, geostrategic and so on and so forth, and the, the countries were, uh, started to fall apart. When that happened, that happened when the nationalities and the republics received not only linguistic rights and cultural rights, but also political rights, with the introduction of, by Gorbachev of elections. And in those elections, it turned out that not only the Ukrainians didn't want to be part of the Soviet Union, they killed the Soviet Union in referendum on independence, on their own independence in December 1991, but the Russians under Yeltsin didn't want to be a donor for other non-Slavic non republics in particular. They didn't mind Ukraine, but they certainly mind Uzbekistan, or, or, or Tajikistan and so on and so forth. So once the republics acquired not only linguistic and cultural rights but also political, that's where the Soviet experiment, experiment ended and the Soviet Union followed into the footsteps of all other major European traditional empires. So that's the 20th century was the age of the fall of the empires. In terms of the, of the pension, that's probably your reference is to the situation now. The, the, the um, uh, pensioners in, in uh, the self-proclaimed republics, they're, they're still uh, claiming pension from the Ukrainian government in Kyiv. So this is still happening. And um, Ukraine now changing the, its own legislation in terms how to treat those territories and they pass the law where the territories will be defined as occupied. And if occupied, this is basically the responsibility of the occupier to to take care of, of that population because at, at that point, I, I don't know, but till recently at least, Kiev was still sending money to the, to the separatist republics. Okay. And the back, sir. Hi, uh, thank you very much. My name is Dimitri. Very interesting presentation. I have uh, two quick questions, very related. How do you think the resurgence of seeing Russia as an empire today, I think that they're trying to present that to their population, how much do you think that influences Russia's foreign policy, and how much is it just for domestic consumption? And the other thing, the other question related to that, I think you said that Russians view Kiev par probably correctly as the birth of their civilization. Does that mean that Russia and Putin won't stop until they control Kiev? Is there some kind of happy medium where he sees we have enough ethnic Russians, we can stop now? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll start with, with the last question. <clears throat> yeah, there is a tradition of more than 300 years 
of, of treating Kyiv as, 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 as a birthplace of monarchy, state, empire, dynasty, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and uh, the monument to Saint Vladimir was built in Kyiv not to celebrate Ukrainians, but to make an imperial claim for that territory against the Poles and the Jews who were significant minorities and quite active minorities in that area. And Ukrainians were treated as part of the Russian people at that time. Uh, what, happens, what happened after 1991 and what still is happening today, and we can see that. So the, the idea is to circumvent Kyiv and exclude it from, from main narrative of the Russian history. Um, the monument to Saint Vladimir in Moscow is one of these also ways, can be interpreted in that way. Now Vladimir is in Moscow, that's, you don't have to Kyiv for pilgrimage to the monument to Vladimir, he is, he is in Moscow. Uh, the, uh, the, the same year, last year, was released, uh, again, celebrating Putin, a major blockbuster, a movie which is called Viking, against, of course, Saint Vladimir, who is portrayed as a, basically a North, Norseman coming from the North like Putin. He came from, from Saint uh, uh, Petersburg, so without, so the, the the Norman, the North Russian origins of the Novgorodian origins of the Russian state that was known as Kiev and Rus. And another, another mo moment is also about important part of the Russian historical mythology, and this is baptism of Rus. And now religion becomes very important. Traditionally, it was considered, okay, Kiev is the place where the baptism took place. Now, with Russia taking over Crimea, the emphasis are that Vladimir accepted Christianity, him personally, not his realm, in the Crimea. So we don't not need Kiev anymore. We have the monument to uh, uh, Vladimir in Moscow, and we have Crimea where the baptism of Rus was taking place, and the origins of the state is in Novgorod. So again, it's, it's not a dominant narrative, but these are elements of the narrative that can become dominant, and they appear as we speak in the last in the last few years in the course of the war as well. So again, we don't know how, how things will go, what that means, because all these things can be interpreted and reinterpreted in thousand ways. But they also provide this opportunity to imagine Russian history that would not include Kiev. Uh, and the, the first question. Well, uh, again, it's it's it's. Uh, uh, I don't think that it, it's easy to uh, draw a clear line because what starts for domestic consumption eventually ends up as a, a foreign policy adventure, and in in Crimea, in particular, that gave tremendous boost to Putin and his popularity at the time when he, it was by by Putin's standard relatively low, but by Russian post-Yeltsin post standards relatively low. It's now uh, g going down a little bit. With the um, war in, in Donbass and the takeover of the Crimea, the Russian nationalists who went to Donbass to fight, now they're back in Russia and uh, waiting for their moment. They're very unhappy with Putin that he allegedly sold down uh, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, that he didn't continue with the project of New Russia, the one that we discussed and the one that is on the map. So Putin for now rides this wave and tries to use it to a degree that it supports its power, but it's again the, the Russian nationalism is on the rise and someday the, the, the horsemen might be not be able to, to control the horse, so that's, that, 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 is, that is a dangerous game. For now he is in control. On the front here, sir. I'm patient. Thank you. My name is John Janace. I'm a strategy consultant and recent graduate of SAIS. Um, my question relates to Russian geopolitical strategy, and I was wondering if you could possibly comment on how, um, specifically, how the Russian military is supporting Russian geopolitical strategy. And I'm thinking specifically about. Um, General Gasserimov's um, notion of new generation warfare, um, 
also known in the West as hybrid warfare, and also how us in the West should be thinking about new generation warfare and all the other things that the Russian military is uh, endeavoring to do, albeit in non-military manner, at least in unconventional non-military manner. Well, um, my, my answer probably will disappoint you. Again, I am a historian. That's, that's where my expertise is. Um, what, what I can say as a historian in very general terms is that it seems to be that the, the Russian foreign policy is deeply rooted in the 19th century understanding of how the world should be organized, and this is about spheres of influence. They departed from that paradigm uh, under Lenin where the model was global revolution, but then went back under Stalin and then continued today under Putin. What that means is a belt of the friendly states, quote unquote, which means controlled by, by the center, controlled by the Moscow around, around first the Soviet Union and now Russia. So I don't think that that is changing. And in terms of the hybrid warfare and, 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 and uh, cyber attacks and things like that, again, I'm not an expert. The only thing that I can say that before these things come to US or come to NATO, they're being tested in Ukraine and the, 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 former, the, the former Soviet Republic. So, uh, so my, my only advice of any value in that sense, please keep a close eye on what is happening there. Time for one last question here, sir. Thank you. Thanks for that fascinating talk. I look forward to reading the book. John Hall, uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, on loan to the joint staff. I wonder if you could elaborate on your, your uh, the affiliation of uh, an idea of a linguistically homogenous state uh, as being a 19th century conception of a nation state, as so much of the 19th century is characterized by polyglot, multi-ethnic empires that in fact unravel in the 20th century, and if the idea uh, of ethnic and linguistic purity is sort of a tribal impulse, it seems to be kind of timeless, but if it ever achieves perfection uh, as manifested in a multiplicity of nation states that are linguistically predominantly predominant, it seems that that's more of a 20th century construction of a nation state rather than a 19th, isn't it? Well, the, the model of lang ethnicity, uh, ethnicity and nation based on language uh, is, of course, uh, is, of course, a German one. So uh, the, the, the creation of a German state, nation state, and creation of Italian state, this, uh, this uh, 19th century phenomenon, that's where the model is set, that eventually then picked up by other smaller groups in Europe and produce, produce the explosion of empires. And explosion of empires, it's really already the 20th century phenomenon, but you have this first, and, 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 and French are going uh, uh, crazy about the purity of the French language in the 19th century, so they're basically trying to turn, to turn whatever they got within their borders into a, into a nation state. And Russians are doing the same at that time. By 1863, they prohibit the publication in Ukrainian. Why? Because basically they understand what is going on, that it's a new nation be, be, being born out of that. And, and, and they, for 50 or 60 years, up until the revolution of 1905, 1907, prohibit not only publications in Ukrainian, but also export of anything written in Ukrainian. So already in the 19th century, empires know, they, 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 they see the writing on the wall, and again, the Germans are extremely, extremely, extremely important about that. Now, the road from the explosion and, and fall of the empires to the creation of the ethnically homogenous states is a long one and a bloody one. You, you, you can look at, at, at Germany, you can look at Poland, the state that is being moved, and, and resettlement of the population, and so on and so forth. So this ideal of, of nation state, the way how Europe acquired it, it's a really very costly enterprise. Two, two world wars. 
And if we imagine for a second that the same rules, language equals ethnicity equals state applies to places like India, to Asia, to Africa, in, in, this, in this new age, we are, we are up for, for really rough ride for the next couple centuries. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Plokey, for that uh, uh, yeah, that uplifting uh, conclusion. But uh, <laughs> well, the, on the positive side, we'll not be there to watch all of it. So. Yes, that's good. Uh, well, please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Plokey for a wonderful presentation.